Um, good afternoon, evening, perhaps morning, depending on where you are. We've got people joining us from uh, various locations and uh, lots of others who have shown interest in this topic who um, will catch up by the recording, which will be sent out to all of you. My name's Jared Tuffield and I'm a representative from Matific and I'm your host this afternoon for our session on back to school roles of essential skill development for students presented by Gavin McCormick. And let me start by just giving you an overview of what it is that we're going to cover in this afternoon session. So I'll tell you a little bit about Gavin. Uh, there's a lot to his story, but we'll, um, we'll give you a little bit of an overview there. Gavin's going to talk about student anxiety um, and teacher anxiety. We're going back to school. Uh, I know when I was teaching, um, some ways I used to feel better once I was back at school than I did on the holidays towards the end because of that anxiety about what was coming with the year ahead. Classroom routines, how to make sure that uh, we'll do our best to get every student reaching their potential. Um, there'll be a little break for about five minutes from Gavin where I'll give you a, a brief overview of what Matific's about and, and a special offer um, to get you um, thinking about how you use digital resources and how Matific perhaps might enhance your classroom math program, sorry. And then there'll be a QA. and a So uh, if you haven't already in the Q&A section during Gavin's talk, put down your questions, please do so in that Q&A uh, towards the end. And in the chat, feel free to let us know from where in the world you are so we get an idea of uh, the community that we have this afternoon, slash this evening, or whatever time zone you're in. So I'll just move this up so we get the full view there of Gavin. He's got a, a wide range of, of skills and, and uh, strings to his bow as an author, philanthropist. Uh, in 2022, uh, the educator named him the most influential educator. And in um, year 2020, he was nominated principal of the year. Uh, Gavin's previously worked as principal of a Montessori school. He's actually made it to the top 10 with uh, the list of influential educators uh, through LinkedIn. Um, you can follow Gavin on LinkedIn. I've just done so myself today. And Gavin um, links classroom to real world uh, practice and emphasizes the importance of skill development at the same time in the way in which uh, he operates. So the, um, the last thing um, that uh, I'll do right now before handing Gavin is um, I'm going to turn off my video and stop sharing my screen and mute myself and we'll hand over to Gavin and we'll rejoin him in time. Okay, thank you so much. And firstly, thank you for that introduction. It's very kind of you to say those wonderful words. Let me just start my slideshow here. And yes, here we go. Okay. Wonderful. Okay, everybody, uh, welcome. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. It is uh, an honor to be here. Uh, and also, it's extremely humbling to hear um, uh, those uh, statements. I often cringe at listening to those things, but I, I appreciate the comment and the uh, recognition for uh, the hard work that we've all put in as teachers, especially over the last few years when it comes to uh, dealing with uh, education and the pandemic. So today, uh, as mentioned earlier, we're going to cover a range of subjects which we'll talk about a little bit later on. But for now, uh, just to introduce the title. Uh, I've named the title of this presentation, What You Are, They Will Become. And this is a uh, representation of uh, what we do as adults, how we model behavior and, and how parents, teachers, and anybody involved in influencing the development and the education of children will influence the way that they live and ultimately what they become as adults. Um, now, the, the reason I've chosen this image you might see here is I spend a lot of time in Nepal in the Himalayas building schools and working in the education system in the subcontinent. As you can see, there is a group of children working on what's called the brown cylinders, and um, there isn't a piece of paper, worksheet, textbook, or teacher in sight. However, there is everything that we all want from education. There's leadership, communication, there is mentorship, there is collaboration, teamwork, active listening, and a number of other things that are unquantifiable. And sometimes the things that count cannot be counted. And when I look at that picture, I see all of those things. So the question is, how can we involve the whole community when it comes to managing anxiety, stress, 
and community expectations of what success actually looks like. And hopefully today we can answer those things. A little bit of an introduction for myself. My name is Gavin McCormack. I am a teacher, 25 years in the making. I've been working uh, as a Montessori principal for quite some time um, and uh, recently opened my own online school called Upschool, which is a basically a real world learning platform that brings free education to children around the world who can't access education. Just to give you a heads up, uh, the angle of which I have taken is that I teach from some of the most remote locations on the planet. Uh, I climb mountains, I visit the North Pole. Next week, I'm going to the South Pole, and I go to some of the deepest jungles on the planet uh, in a hope to inspire children to want to know more about subjects which are quite uh, removed from everyday life. And if you want to know more, of course, you can scan the QR code and find out more about me. But it's not about me today. It's all about you. So let's get moving. So what will we cover today? First of all, as mentioned earlier, back to school anxiety students and teachers. Secondly, we'll talk about establishing classroom routines. Thirdly, we'll look at early skills development and how to unleash each student's potential. I've got some things to give away to you today. So if you've got a mobile phone, grab it because I'll be scanning some QR codes for you to uh, take a look at and download something. And lastly, how to maximize digital resources. But the reason I've chosen this picture here on your screen is because of the boy in the blue. Now, anybody who's a teacher here, anybody who works in education, anybody who works in educating children will know that we don't do this job for the money. We don't do this job for the glory. We do this job for the smile on a children's face, just like the boy in the blue. And that is what makes teaching so unique. And that's what makes teachers so unique in the way that they work. So uh, I want to use this kind of uh, platform to recognize and appreciate all the teachers out there. The big question that I want to pose today is, and this is a, a kind of an overview of everything we're going to talk about, is how can we live our lives as humans, as a human being, whilst continuing to be inspirational teachers? Quite often what happens as a teacher is teaching takes over your entire existence. In fact, many of us will spend our holidays in school and their holidays for a reason. So the question is, how can we find the balance between becoming a teacher and being a, a, an inspirational teacher, but also having time for yourself to be motivated and to be inspirational to your students? Because as we know, teacher burnout is a huge problem in the world right now. And the idea behind tonight's presentation is to utilize what we know and the research around to enhance our own teaching ability, but also our own well-being. So let's get some perspective. Teachers are amongst the most resilient, determined, and passionate people who roam the earth. Now, teachers out there, all of you, and I want to use this platform to celebrate who you are, are doing an amazing job. Quite underestimated and underrated is the profession of education. However, it is a profession and teachers are professionals. Therefore, they should be treated as such. We do not go to the doctor, get a prescription, and then ask the doctor if it's the right medication. We do not get a house designed by an architect and then question the angles or the materials. We trust them. And teachers also need to have that trust too. Just because people went to school doesn't mean they know how to teach. So I want to celebrate all teachers out there and say well done and an amazing achievement of being a teacher and continue to do the work that you are doing. Without teachers, there would be no other professions. That is a fact. So what is the first step to lowering anxiety? It's giving everyone a voice. And that voice includes you, you as teachers. And what I mean by a voice is that you need to be able to tell your story as well as theirs. And you need to have a life to be able to tell your story. There is no story if you spend 24 hours a day, 365 days a year in school. There is no story to tell. Now, let me give you some perspective of the power of a story. In 1937, a rapidly spreading virus with no known cure. This was called polio. It made it too dangerous for children to attend school. And this is very similar to the one we've just had. However, children were not allowed to leave their homes for the fear of dying. What happened? The BBC World Service decided to um, enroll or employ 24 of the most dynamic, well-experienced storytellers of all time. And what were they supposed to do? They were supposed to tell their stories over the radio, over the radio to educate the British children. 
And what happened was the whole world tuned in because the stories were so inspirational. They were so gripping that children could literally learn over the radio. And that tells us two things. Number one, we do not need all the bells and whistles of resources to inspire our students. But number two, when a teacher has time to live their life, to experience the world, to climb a mountain, to go walking in the forest, to swim in the ocean and have their senses enlightened and bring that back into the classroom, it is very, very easy to be able to inspire our students. So quite often we look for technology or we look for money or resources or new textbooks or new furniture to inspire our students and get the ball rolling. But actually, the inspiration behind lower anxiety in yourself and your students is living your life and using those holidays, those weekends and those evenings to, to develop your well-being, to manage your well-being and your mindset and your mindfulness. Because a teacher who comes into the classroom who is inspired will have an inspired group of students sitting before them. So the first point is to be able to separate your work life from your real life. And this will also model a behavior to your students that when they become any kind of employee in any organization, it doesn't mean that that work becomes their life. That's number one. Number two, it's all about rules. Now, we all have classroom rules, but these rules must apply to not only the children in your class, but you too. So if you're going to tell your children to do something, you must also do it yourself. These rules have to be written with a positive tone and they have to be modeled by yourself because you are the guide. The children are watching you astutely to see what you are doing and what you are doing, they will become. As Montessori said, model the behavior you wish to view in your children. And here's an example for you of some rules you might want to think about. So when you are documenting your rules, a really important thing to do is not focus on the negatives, not have the do nots, not have the I will never, not have the no shouting, but have statements of positivity. So these are things that build a classroom culture. These are things that build your values. We will only use kind words. We keep people's secrets. We never disturb people if they are busy. We always speak the truth, even if we did something wrong. And these are very important not only for your students, but also for yourself, because these will lower the anxiety in your room, meaning that your children will understand that this is a collective responsibility. This room belongs to you, it belongs to them, it belongs to everybody. What happens to one happens to all. And this is extremely important. And it's also important, if possible, that these rules or guidelines are given to parents at home. Because as we know, an average child will spend around 540 hours at home and only 140 hours in your classroom. So you do not have the power. You do not have the influence over the children that the parents do. So what is happening in your room must also happen in the home if you want to succeed. Number three, and this is not a must, but this is a wonderful thing that can happen, to provide each children with a diary. Now, this is a sacred book, which can be very, very cheap. It doesn't have to be fancy. But what happens when you give your children in your class a diary, even from kindergarten or beforehand? Several things happen when everybody in your class is given this sacred, secret book within the room. Number one, this is a safe space where they can doodle. They can take notes. They can write reflections. They can write their emotions. They can even plan their day or their week. They develop a sense of responsibility as they now have something that belongs to them and them alone. It becomes a secret vault of information and feelings. And this can be something that can be shared with you as the teacher. It can also be used as a time management skill routine where children can plan their day. They can organize times. They can set things in stone that are going to happen that day. Teachers can also use this diary as a reflection tool. So when starting conversations with children regarding particular topics, we can look in their diary with their permission and ask them to tell me what happened on Monday. Do you have any notes in your diary? 
But the last thing I will say is it gives children an extremely safe space to express their feelings and thoughts. And if you can provide a time in the day where reflection is mandatory. So it is 3.15, we are going home in five minutes. I would love you to open your diaries and write down a time today when you felt extremely happy or a time today where it was difficult. And if you want on Monday, you can share that with me. And maybe a child will write something very honest and very humble or very heartwarming and say something like, I felt lonely on the playground today. Nobody ever lets me play. And maybe they can't voice that to you. Maybe they can't speak it out loud. But they know that when they write it in their diary and you have a chance to read it, that you will then be their confidant, their support network, and then potentially help them. So a very simple um, addition to your classroom, such as a diary, can really improve and lower anxiety. And I haven't put this in the presentation. It's something I recently discovered. One of the things, the big mistakes I used to make was in the school holidays, I would reorganize the classroom. I'd move the tables, I'd put new posters up, I'd move the shelves, thinking that when the children came back, they'd be so excited to see this new classroom and all the work I'd done in the holidays. But what I realized recently after talking to Mark Williams, who's a leading neurologist here in Australia, was that there was a big mistake. Actually, what I was doing was I was creating a space for the children to come back to, which they had no understanding of. So they came back with anxiety because they didn't know what was around the bookcase. Their tables were moved. The posters had changed. And in reflection, what I should have been doing is towards the end of the term or when I wanted to move the classroom around, I should have involved the children to say, on Friday, we're going to rearrange the classroom and we're going to do it together. Because what that means is, they come back from the holidays and they're aware where everything is, where they're sitting, where their table has moved, and the anxiety is extremely lower because of this. Now, let's, that takes us straight into classroom routines. Classroom routines, we can set them in stone if we want. However, each class is different, and therefore there's a multitude of variables around the world. So what we like to promote is freedom within limits giving your children freedom, but have limitations within those freedoms. So what you're looking at now is a model of something which is called homunculus. This model has been around for many, many years, and it might look a bit scary. But actually what this model is, is there's a representation of a child. And the organs within the child's body have been uh, shrunk or enlarged in proportion to the cognitive input they have to the child's brain. Now, what you will notice immediately is the hands are extremely big. Number two, you will notice that the mouth is extremely big too. Now, what that tells us is if we want our children to be more engaged, if we want our children to, more, to be more involved in their learning in the classroom routine, we have to allow them to touch. They must be able to touch everything and anything they wish within the room. Number two, we must encourage them to talk. The mouth and the hands are the two biggest factors when it comes to cognitive development of our students. This research was conducted in Harvard University with 17,000 children. And over that time, they realized that when children touched, when they were involved in moving things and talking about things and discussing things, that the learning was better, anxiety was lower. What's really important, though, is that, as you can see on the model, there are literally no ears. And what we do in our schools, and I'm guilty of this myself for many years, is we talk at our children or we talk to them and we tell them what they're going to do. We tell them what's coming next. We tell them what we're learning today and we even tell them what they should know. What we actually should be doing is involving them in all of those discussions, building the classroom rules, writing the routine, setting the time frames, when are they going to do this, organizing the classroom and discussing it. When we do that, when we involve them and they can touch and talk about these things, the learning is better and the safety, anxiety and development of our children is heightened because this research proves to us that while our children are sitting down silently with their fingers on their lips listening to us talk all day, we're actually failing them and we're making our lives more difficult. So take a look at these two photographs, two images here. On the left-hand side, you will see my Montessori school in Manly. That is a stage one classroom. Uh, as you can see, no teacher is visible. Children are moving, walking, discussing, working in pairs, sitting on the floor, standing up, talking. They're working in groups. Some children are choosing. No one is facing the front. 
The teacher is completely invisible. In fact, she is behind one of the shelves. But within that room, there is a lot of learning taking place. There is conversation. There is movement. There is touch. There is talk. There is even taste if you look carefully. Now, why am I saying this? Because if you look in the bottom right corner, you will see the head office of one of the most profitable organizations in San Francisco and the world, Airbnb, one of the most creative and dynamic workspaces in the world, a very similar layout. You can sit where you like, you can talk, you can move, and you can choose. And for us as children, sorry, for us as teachers, we need to make sure that our classrooms are representative of what's going to be happening when our children enter the real world. Will they be sitting in rows and listening to somebody all day filling in worksheets? I certainly doubt it. The future is here. It's the 21st century. And this is the kind of world we are going into. Now, we can't teach essential skills. This is impossible. You cannot teach a child to be creative. You can't teach them to have empathy. You cannot teach them to be confident. But essential skills are things that must be learned through experience. Now, when we actually change the way that our students engage with learning, when we change the way that our classrooms look, change the way that we teach, change the way that our routines function within the room, we see that an array of 21st century skills or soft skills, as we call them, are developed. They are developed by the children and they're developed collectively. Skills such as critical thinking, initiative, leadership, left brain detail, right brain creative thinking, adaptability, self-direction, time management, flexibility, even humility. And we get things like grace and courtesy negotiation, conflict resolution, and a global perspective. All of these skills are skills which are sought after by some of the leading companies in the planet. If you look at SpaceX, Wikipedia, Amazon, Google, all these wonderful innovative organizations, they don't look for resumes with grade A's and 100%. They actually look for people who have skills, real life skills, that will enhance the company and make the world slightly better. So if we can change our perspective of what a routine looks like, and we give the children freedom, agency, and choice, we see that these skills are developed. And I'll give you something later, which will allow you to implement these into your classroom. Now, as a teacher, our job actually is to provide an environment in our rooms where children can follow their wildest dreams. Now, you might think to yourself, why have I got a, um, you know, an A1619 Globemaster 3 sitting on the right hand side? And I want to just tell you a very quick story. Um, I was walking through a bush, the bushland uh, near my school with a group of students. And in the distance, I saw what I thought was a Lancaster bomber. I had a group of uh, six year olds and I pointed at this uh, aircraft and I said, everybody stop. Look, hey, this is a Lancaster bomber in the distance. And one boy put his hand up. He said, Mr. McCormack, that is not a Lancaster bomber. That's a C-19 Globemaster III. You can tell by the shape of the engines. And I asked him, how do you know that? And he said, I know every single aircraft that was involved in World War II, World War I, and is employed by the United Air Force at the moment. And I realized that he had a passion that I didn't know about. And our job is actually to find out what is the niche? What is the driver for all of our students? Because they will become disengaged. There will be things in our curriculum, our timetable, our routine that they're not excited about. And our job is to bring their passion into the curriculum to engage them and want them to learn more. It's a tricky job, but once we get to know our students, and I'm not talking about even getting to know them academically, getting to know them you know, in terms of their ranking, but getting to know who they are, what they love, what they like, what their dreams are, what their fears are, when we know this, we can truly teach our students because we can truly engage with their personality. Now, if you want to know more about the essential skills, I've done the research for you and I've actually provided and produced a booklet, which I'm sure you will like. What I've done here is I've separated into four terms and uh, each term has got 10 weeks. Each of those weeks is assigned a core or essential skill for the 21st century. This is a booklet that I've made. You can take it if you wish, scan the QR code, it will download straight onto your telephone and you can share it, email it with whoever you like. But what it does, it gives you 
a core skill to focus on each and every week. And you can do that in your class. You can do it as a routine. You can start your day by talking about that skill. You can have a circle time, a group. You might have a notice board. This week, we're looking and talking all about motivating others. And that might be the conversation you have in the morning. You might have that conversation in the afternoon, too, as a precursor to going home. But interestingly, children today in kindergarten will graduate in 2034 or 33 slash 34. So that's 12 years from now. Now, you might think that you know what kind of content these children will need, but I, I want to rebut that statement by saying, I don't think you do. Because 12 years ago, uh, there was no uh, Google Maps. The iPhone had just been invented and there was not one electric car on the streets. So what that means is that we actually think we know what our students need, but we don't. We know one thing for sure. We know what skills they will need. They will need the essential skills for life. They will never go out of date. They will always be applicable to the real world. And there are 40 of them. I've done the research for you. Take a look, scan the QR code, take the document and feel free to use it and uh, share it with anybody that you know. Now, as a teacher, when it comes to routine, actually, the it's quite the opposite of a routine. We're looking at flexibility. As a teacher, we need to be flexible. This is the power of you saying yes. Now, this starts in lots of different ways. But the first thing to say is that if you want to have a healthy, independent classroom filled with confident learners, the first thing to do is to let them know that what is applicable to them is applicable to you. You, If you are going to ask the children to tidy the classroom, you will be tidying too. If you are going to ask the children to whisper, you will be whispering too. And if you are going to ask the children to have silent reading between 12 and 12.30, then you are going to be silent reading too. What you are, they will become. The second thing to say is to open up every cupboard door in the classroom, to make sure that the students know that what is in that room belongs to them and you. So they don't have to ask permission to get the card or use the paint or touch the scissors or go to the bathroom, because these things are things that I trust you to be able to do, because this is your classroom and this is mine. And yes, you may make a mistake. You may use all the card and you may you know, drop the paint on the ground. And that is completely fine. We all make mistakes. But teachers, we must be allowed as teachers to go with the flow, to teach from our heart and to move with the times. If there is a super moon on a Wednesday night, you must be allowed to teach the moon on Thursday morning, whether it's in the curriculum or not. Now, the reason I've got this slide on here, because it's probably one of the most important slides that I've come across in my years. At the top, teachers can differentiate the content you teach, the process in which your students learn, and the product which you require as an outcome. All of us can do that, no problem whatsoever. At the bottom, we all require growth, motivation from our students, and efficiency in terms of the work that they do. The question is, how do we get there? And that's where the middle comes in. Number one, we need to know, are our students ready? Are they ready for what we are about to teach them, socially, emotionally, and academically? If they are not, we don't teach it, because ultimately, there will be failure. Number two, what interests do our students have? Going back to the C19 Globe Master 3, before we can teach our students, we need to know what they're interested in. You might be teaching Roman history, and in your class, there is a child whose father is a paleontologist who knows everything about the Roman historians and the life of a Roman or dinosaurs or whatever the subject is. It's our job to get that child at the front and help us teach alongside us. And number three, what is the learning profile of our students in terms of any additional needs and how do they like to learn? Are they auditory, kinesthetic, visual? How do they like to learn and where do they like to learn? Maybe they don't like to sit in a chair. Maybe they like to sit on the floor. Maybe they like to stand up. Maybe they have got auditory processing disorder and they don't want to hear too many noises or they don't like having over sensory uh, stimulus. So they might, might want to face the wall. And our job as a teacher is to get those three sections in the middle and completely understand them. And when we do, we cannot fail by seeing success in our classrooms. And that brings us 
to the end of this presentation when I want to talk to you about technology. Technology is in the news at the moment, obviously, with AI and chat GPT, but technology has been around for a very long time. Some schools like to avoid it. Some schools like to embrace it. My advice, and this goes to parents and teachers, is to once again give our students freedom within limits, set some parameters, but not remove technology from them altogether. Technology is amazing. We wouldn't be in this webinar right now without technology. So we can't argue the fact that it is an amazing tool. However, it must be used in your classroom with limited access. And I'll give you an example of how I would stress that this is possible. If you have a couple of computers in your room, I would suggest that in your classroom, there is a booking system where students can book the computer for maybe 20, 25 minute slot each day. As they come in the classroom, they look at the timetable, they see what's happening, and they book a slot, slot to be able to use the computer in association with the things that they are learning. This is extremely important because it gives our students responsibility to choose. It gives them agency. It also allows them to explore technology, but in their own time. Number one. Number two, it must be used alongside other methods. So technology is not the answer. Google, ChatGPT are all amazing resources for us. However, the, the stimulus must be chosen between a variety of methodologies. So we must say to our students, look, you can use ChatGPT, you can use Google, but I also need some references from my book. I also need you to interview somebody. And I also need you to get something from an audio uh, book or an audio stimulus. So I need four pieces of reference before you can actually give your work to me. And what that says to our students, it says that technology is a tool. However, it is not the only place that I go for the answers or for assistance. Because what we want to see from our students, like any good journalist or author or PhD student, is that you have gathered your research from a variety of sources. And that might mean that your students have a rubric that says, when you present your presentation to me or your speech to the class, you must have gathered your knowledge from four different places and you must prove to me which four they are. And they can be, I used the computer, I used the library, I asked my grandfather and I interviewed the principal. And that's completely fine. But I think that technology is an amazing tool, but it must be used with freedom within limits. So it's not the be all and end all. And I'll finish with this statement. When we allow our teachers, which is you, to follow their passion, to find their niche, and to work with true intention and purpose, we build a culture of trust and autonomy within our team that results in increased engagement, achievement, and retention in our schools. And I will finish the presentation by saying thank you and saying that I appreciate every teacher who's here today. I know that you have a busy schedule and time frame. And I thank you for listening. And I hand it over to you for any questions you may have. Thank you, Gavin. If you don't mind stopping sharing your screen and I'll reshare mine. The, uh, that was just amazing. Um, you've got a few minutes now, everybody, to, um, to get those questions into the Q&A section. Um, there were some questions coming up already during that uh, presentation. Uh, in particular about um, the sharing of the slideshow, Gavin. So I said I'd leave that for you to comment, but certainly the recording of the session, which obviously has the slideshow shown in it, will be sent out to each and every one of you, as well as everybody who registered but was unable to attend. Uh, so I'll just check there. You are able to see my screen again. Is that correct? Philip, Gavin? Yep. Thank you. So, um, uh, look, I, um, I will come back and, and comment. Uh, at the end, I think um, really there are things there that um, that I'd like to to comment on myself. But uh, just briefly to take this few minutes while those Q and A's are coming in, or the questions, the Q's are coming in, uh, just to give you a better idea about Matific, and and I'll try and relate that too uh, to to what Gavin was just saying, because um, you know the, even the last point we're talking, he was just talking there about technology, and I think when it comes down to looking at technology, it's really about what is it that you're doing with it. And what drew me as a teacher to Matific was that I was looking for an online maths resource that would not only engage my students, 
but would do so in a way that developed their conceptual understanding. Um, so I'd had a principal say to me years ago in Tasmania, in fact, that um, why can't the things that the kids do for educational online resources be like the things they do for recreation that they just have that passion for and love and, and can become actually so, so addictive. Um, and so uh, when I saw Matific, I realized it wasn't just simply closed question answered, taking an old style printed digital worksheet and putting it on the screen with perhaps some extrinsic uh, reward system and thinking, well, that was enough. So um, what I think separates Matific from other online maths resources is the pedagogy. And as I listened to Gavin talk about his pedagogical principles, so many of them echo with the ones you'll find listed on our website and which are illustrated in what we do, that we're encouraging students to be risk takers, have a go. Don't feel you're gonna get punished by a big red cross. You'll get a little wobble if you're not getting something correct and you'll get another turn at it. That you'll get scaffolding. And this activity we've just seen here, um, the students can click here to fold the net and see how the net looks folded, or they can simply do it without folding the net, but they can manipulate the 3D shape. And again, using the latest technology, you know, we're one about delivering uh, 21st century education with 21st century technology, not 20th or 19th or 18th century uh, education through our technology. So we've got thousands of these types of rich activities that the students love. And I've had that sort of feedback this week with um, parents and teachers who I've checked back in who have started Mativic this year. And it's quite common to have them say the kids are just loving it. So we want to go beyond the screen. And, you know, it, it's... Gavin was talking about the, the importance of kids actually getting in and doing things. And that's one of our pedagogical principles. And, and while it's a virtual representation of the mathematical context, what we're doing here is it's giving them virtual manipulatives as opposed to physical ones. And while there may be no substitute for the physical, it's um, not so easy to suddenly go, get a dunking tank in your classroom and a cannon to uh, shoot the kids in order to create a context perhaps here for measuring with the protractor. Obviously there are other ways you could do it, but whether it's those heavy weights we saw before and finding them when they're in the classroom or even the visibility aspect of, of having students sometimes being able to see what you're modeling. So I think that if you're looking at a technological resource, what you wanna look at is, is not just, it's, oh, we have a maths resource that's on screen or, or it's digital. What sort of context are the kids given for doing the mathematics? What types of problems are they getting? Is it a case of one solution only to a problem or are there multiple ones? So you can get that discourse going that Gavin was talking about and students can be saying, well, I solved the problem this way, but someone else perhaps had a different solution for it. So there's a lot of people just to not interrupt you saying they can't see your screen. Oh, right. I was sort of saying about, um, all right, that sharing. That is a shame. Let me just come back here. Right. Hopefully that's better now. Yeah. Okay, so um, just I obviously won't recap all of that, but just give some of the visuals there that you're seeing. As I said, you know, the students, and instead of having the big heavy metal weights, which particularly become expensive in recent years, I know as um, I've dealt with them, uh, with mineral prices have gone up, um, but giving them the same sort of experience, but in a virtual way that the principle is that you're giving them mathematics in a context, you're getting them to use natural language, not just mathematical language, you're giving things in, in a way that is not abstract before you move to the abstract, and that the students um, are, are getting that representation of the concept that, so they form a true understanding. They're not simply generating an answer through a procedural approach to mathematics, where they may get an answer but have no understanding as to why that is the answer. Um, so. Um, You'll see that in the activities we've got with what we call episodes, it's giving a, a, a representation of a life type, real life context, and the students are using materials, just virtual materials, not physical materials. But I think the same achievement can, uh, the same outcome can be achieved um, as you would with rolling real die, dice, except that uh, it's a lot more visible if you're doing it with a large group. And then if you do want to work with small group students, as I hope you do, 
and even individual students, you do need something for them to be able to, um, for the other students to be able to do independently that's going to engage them and excite them while you're working with the students who are in the small group physical hands-on activity. And an online resource can be that, but just what you don't want is just simply a list of questions um, on a digital sheet as opposed to a printed sheet. Now there's a QR code over to the side to just pointing that out, just move that. Um, if you haven't experienced Mativic before and you wish to scan that QR code, there's quite a few QR codes in this presentation and uh, we'll set you up with not just a standard trial, but trial right through the end of this month and the following month. And you'll have plenty of access for your students to Mativic. It's mapped to the curriculum. You can view things by topics, or if you do use the Oxford Maths or the Oxford uh, Maths Plus series, you can actually search for your content that way and assign activities then to the class, to a group, to individuals, and you can schedule them for when you want those activities to roll out to the students and when you want them to be due and to expire. I just get that to move on. Okay, so um, what we'll have a look at now is uh, the Q and A's that have come in, and um, and see um, what uh, Gavin would uh, would like to um, talk about. And sorry, I wasn't seeing that uh, at that point. Noise level and brain breaks, Gavin. Would you like to talk about that? Yes. So we got. Uh, so we're going through the questions here. Uh, so Olivia, Olivia Martin. Yes. What are your view on noise levels and brain breaks? How to use effectively? Well, look. Um, I have an interesting perspective on this because I'm a Montessori teacher. Um, so I was mainstream teacher for 15 years, but then I became a Montessori teacher. And if you know about Montessori, which I'm sure you do, um, when children need a break, when they want some time to themselves there is a space in the room where they can go. And that's just one of the uh, prerequisites of being in the classroom. Similarly, the teacher can also use that space if he or she wishes, so at any point. Now, the noise levels is a very interesting one. And I, I uh, want to uh, just give you an idea, if I may, of a, of a, try, a trial and error exercise in your classroom. If you feel that the noise level in your class is too loud, then there's a very good um, methodology where you as a teacher suddenly just start whispering. Not so it's unaudible, but just lower your voice and watch what happens. Suddenly the class will fall in line and follow exactly what you are doing to the point where maybe it's too quiet. But um, quite often it's because you are talking loud, you have a big loud voice like myself, and the children are just replicating that. They're just modeling the behavior they're seeing before them. I'm not saying that you're shouting, but when you start to lower your tone and just walk around the class whispering, okay, everybody, well, how's it going over here? What are you up to? Suddenly it becomes a thing that happens in the room. Similarly, you can have um, a simple um, bell. I I've used this many times before. There are two really, really good uh, strategies which I'll put to you, which you can use. And there's a couple of questions about noise actually. Number one, you can have a small bell in the classroom. It's very small, a little like a little ding, 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 like it's not a big loud, you know, it's oh yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, not this, there's a small little bell in the corner. And if the noise level becomes too high, it's not your job to ring the bell and tell the children to be quiet. You allow children to go and get the bell and ring it, and everybody stops and looks over, and the person says, It's a little bit loud. Do you think we could lower the volume? And you give it to the children as their responsibility to regulate the volume. Number two, and I've seen this in action, I've tried it, I read it in a report out of Houston University, and I tried it in my school. Um, what happens when you play bird song in your classroom? I'm not talking about having very loud, para, you know, Laura Keats tweeting in the room, but a very quiet little Bluetooth speaker hidden behind a plant in the corner of your room playing bird song. And if you go on YouTube, you'll find thousands of like 10 hour long bird song tunes, just little you know, tweets and, and, and coups and whatnot. Now, here's the research. The research says that when you hear birdsong, you automatically lower your anxiety levels, you feel relaxed, and ultimately you lower your volume. Um, and the reason is because if you go back in time, when we were hunter-gatherers in the forest and birds were singing, it meant there were no predators. Birds were singing beautifully and quietly. There were no predators around. 
So the anxiety levels were lower and we were calmer. Therefore, the room was calmer. And so um, when birds stopped singing, they'd flown away. It was completely gone. It was silent in the forest because they'd scarpered because it was a tiger or a leopard. And therefore, you were more anxious as a hunter-gatherer because it was too quiet. So I give you a challenge, and this works. I tried it in my classroom in a very noisy room I had at school. Small speaker, hidden away behind a plant, really quietly, have some bird song playing, and watch what happens in your room. The noise level will drop significantly. The room will become calmer and ultimately a better place to be. I, uh, I, I give you the challenge of trying that one. It's beautiful, really, really nice, and really a good thing to see. Ironically, Gavin, I muted myself before because there was a bird chirping outside my window and I thought people might be saying it's uh, it's distracting them. Uh, we also, uh, it's interesting when, when the students first log in Pacific, we uh, we have bird uh, song as the uh, the background sound there. And I hadn't thought about why that was chosen. Perhaps that's it. Uh, the, so this the top one here seems to be talking about concern with, with parents. And I know you did talk a little about that early on with, Parents tend to sometimes think because they went to school, therefore they're experts on education. Um, so if you want to pick up on that one, um, I'm not sure when it's saying uh, the activity the teacher may do outside the curriculum. Sorry, I'm not seeing that one. Um, oh, you, so um, not at the you, top here. Could you read the question? I'm one here. See it. Oh, yes. Okay. How to implement the kind yeah. of teaching while we realize uh, Asian countries, some parents may be concerned with their child really uh, learn just play. Okay, my question is about activity and a teacher may do outside the curriculum. Now, that's a very good question. It's a very good question, especially if you're listening on, you're coming in from the subcontinent, you're coming from China, you come from India. These countries are predominantly geared and just come from India working in a huge school there, geared towards percentages, grades, high rankings, 100%. Now, I think what's really important there is we as teachers, we're experts in this field. This is our profession. So we're the, we're the ones who know what we're doing. There's no question about that. Our job is to look at the outcomes within the curriculum and see how we can implement them with real world application in terms of, yes, we're going to learn about mathematics and we're going to learn about numbers. We're going to learn about multiples. We're going to learn about factors. We're learning about space, dinosaurs, geography, whatever it is we're learning about. Our job, our role is to make that real. To make it real in the classroom, because then we can actually achieve the goals which are in the curriculum, the outcomes. However, it becomes tangible to our students. And I will give you a perfect example of this. And there are thousands of them, actually. And this is what I do for my work now, actually develop real world learning curriculum and content. But if you think about writing a persuasive letter, if you think about this, what happens in 99.9% .9 of schools in the world and writing a persuasive letter is in the curriculum without a doubt. What do we do? We write a letter, we teach the children syntax, we teach them persuasive devices, adjectives, the structure of a letter, how to write a sentence, punctuation, handwriting skills. And then we ask them to write a letter to the school principal to change the canteen or ban school uniforms. They write the letter, they give it to the principal. Number one, he doesn't read it or she doesn't read it because they're too busy. Number two, there's no response. And number three, there's no change. So the canteen doesn't change, the uniform is still worn, the playtime is still 15 minutes, not 25 as requested. Now that's in the curriculum. How can we make it real? We say to the students, now we're going to choose an SDG from the United Nations Sustainability Goals for the World. You're gonna choose one that matters to you. And now we're going to write a real letter, a letter to somebody who is a decision maker in the government, an influencer, a businessman, an entrepreneur, somebody who can actually change things. And we teach them syntax, grammar, sentence structure, the structure of a letter, and they write a real letter and we post it, and we wait for the response. Our job actually is not to do things outside of the curriculum. Our job is to use the curriculum as a guide, but make those outcomes come to life, make them real. And that's the ultimate challenge for all teachers is to look at those outcomes and devise activities where they can be used in real world application. So our students get real world feedback, because think about it. If a child writes a letter and we put a tick and say, this is a wonderful letter, and it goes in their folder as a portfolio piece, what is the good? What is the use of that letter? It actually has no purpose whatsoever. But if they write it and they post it and we wait for a response, and maybe that minister turns up at the school, or maybe that influential businessman writes back to you at school, then 
That is the real success of a letter. So we let the success or the grade be the outcome from which the community receives that letter and then responds accordingly. And that's our ultimate objective as teachers. How can we make these outcomes come to life and become real? Uh, um, Gavin, somebody's asked, what's the name again of the child development model that you mentioned? The one, the homunculus model I just showed? Which model are you talking uh, just about? The, just down the bottom, Kate, if you can uh, add more. Representation, could you but... please relate the name of the child development model? Um, I'm not I'm not clear of which one she's talking about. Okay, I suppose it will be captured in the recording, Kate, uh, if we get, get it there. Yeah, so if you're talking Certainly... about, the, yes, if it's about, yes, I know which one you're talking about. It's called homunculus. And a homunculus is an old model, uh, but it came out of uh, Harvard University after some further research. It's actually really, really wonderful because it demonstrates straight away to any teaching staff or any groups of individuals working with children how to actually utilize um, the senses to, um, to enhance the learning potential of your students. I can certainly relate to all this, Gavin. I, um, I now get my car serviced by a student that I taught. and. Um... He was quite a challenging boy to engage in lots of ways in school, but he had an incredible passion for animals. And uh, I was always looking for every opportunity I could to uh, to turn things so that he could um, bring his love of animals. And he did some amazing work uh, around that. Um, I think too, so say as teachers, you know, and I say say this um, to my own children, you know, they say chase your passion, not your pension. Uh, and even you know now when I'm with Matific, it's it's not about uh, going to uh, a sales job to make lots of money. It's about a, you know, a resource you know that I feel will really improve education for students. And you know you you made a comment where you said that um, uh, don't disturb you know one of your rules, classroom rules. Don't disturb uh, people when they're busy. It's certainly one of the challenges in a job like mine because teachers are always busy. Um, whatever time of year, there's always so much on. How would you approach structured literacy? Um, whole language and so on. Um, there's sort of the, still that ongoing debate, isn't there, about whole language versus phonics approaches and, and does it actually need to be one or the other? I think that language is the most cross-curricular and literacy is the most cross-curricular subject we have uh, sitting in our curriculum. It can literally be uh, tied into every single other KLA that exists mathematics, history, geography, of course. Um, and I guess our role, what we do predominantly in our schools is we have a special time for literacy. This is time for literacy now. And what happens with our students, unfortunately, is they get into a flow. Say we're writing a story or we're pr producing a presentation or a comic or a recipe or whatever we're learning uh, at the current time. Our students get into that flow and they get into this wonderful flow state. And then we, we ring a buzzer and we stop the clock and say, it's now time for mathematics, put that away. And the child, you know, doesn't say this, but thinks this like, hey, I was in the middle of that. Like, I was really engrossed in this work. Uh, and that's not fair. And it actually isn't fair. Our job, our role and our kind of uh, expectation is to be able to link literacy into almost every other subject there is. For example, if you're learning about the Egyptians or ancient Egypt, you know, why can't that be literacy? That is literacy. If you're learning about weight, you know, you're talking about weight then comparing kilograms, you know, to some, uh, you know, some object, that can easily be literacy. Because if you think about, for example, the Weddell seal in Antarctica, it weighs 280 kilograms. And so a day in the life of a Weddell seal weighing 280 kilograms could easily be linked to literacy and science combined. So our role and our job, and this is one of the fundamental flaws and problems that we have as teachers, is we segregate and separate all of our subjects. And we actually do ourselves a disservice because we busy the curriculum. We try to squeeze everything in. There's no time. There's no time for children to be. There's no time for children to go to the quiet area and have mindfulness. There's no time for them to talk or um, you know, reflect or fill in their diary because it's bang, 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 bang. I must cover all this content. But when we look at it in great detail and we take a step back, there's actually amazing cross-curricular opportunities across all KLAs where they can be taught at the same time. And so when we talk about a whole or structured approach to literacy, I think literacy is actually the subject 
that can tap into every other subject that we actually teach in our curriculum. And, and that would make our life a lot easier rather than having that separated time frame where we make it an individual lesson where it doesn't touch any other subjects. I know that in, in the points when I introduced you, the last one talked about the fact that you you look at real life context, but you you tie that in with skills. And that's what I was saying. It's not one or the other. And um, out of context, um, things can can have no meaning, whether whether it's in literacy, where uh, a, a friend of mine has an Asperger son who would probably know more about politics and world history than most adults at at, um, at the age of about 13. He's incredible what he knows. Uh, but occasionally he will totally mispronounce the name of, of some person or country. And his father will say, see, he's trying to just do it phonetically. And that name isn't pronounced that way. And, and that all comes down as we, we know that in reading, you've got to, um, you've got multiple queuing systems and that, that semantic knowledge is the most important. I think likewise, when it comes to mathematics, that um, uh, there are students who can tell you all their number facts, but when you give them a problem where they need to actually apply that knowledge, don't even realize that they need to multiply uh, numbers rather than add them in that, that particular context. <laughs> yeah, exactly So with right. the model people are asking about, that was correct. Um, they were saying that the the actual um, structure with the the no ears and the big hands, that was the- Yes, that's right. That? And okay, look, just, so to, think... to, just to touch on something that's already been said, but just to give you an anecdotal example of this, uh, I've just recently been working with a school in Nasik in India, which is just east of Mumbai. And it's a school called Rise Experiential School. Now, this school is in the middle of the countryside, surrounded by vineyards. And they wanted to take on an approach of real world learning, to have something where the children will be able to apply all of the things which are in the curriculum, but into the real world. So we gave them a chance to choose an SDG. Now, an SDG is for the United Nations. You probably know them all. There are 17 of them, and they vary in their choices and what they do. But one of those SDGs is actually climate change, SDG 13. Now, if you look at climate change in its entirety, you can literally link every single KLA there is, especially mathematics. There's no question about it. We're looking at statistics, numbers, facts, trends, patterns. We're looking at time. We're looking at changing chemical compositions, CO2 in the air, all these things. So we gave the children the opportunity to choose an SDG. And as a school, they chose SDG 13 which meant they wanted to achieve a goal of making a difference in the world within the fundamentals of that SDG. They wanted to limit climate change. Now, what, that might seem impossible uh, to anybody listening to this. You know, how can I limit climate change? I'm just one person. And yes, there are only 500 children, but here's what they did. They used the power of literacy. They learned about persuasive devices and emotive language, and they wrote to a prominent minister about what they wanted to do. And their objective was to plant a forest. They wrote to a minister and said, we would like to plant a forest. Where we live, we literally have no birds. There are some vineyards, but birds are not attracted. We have no birds here. We haven't seen a bird in one year. This was their argument. And we want to see birds. Do you have any land in this district that we could have for free? And 500 children wrote 500 persuasive letters and they all posted them and they all arrived at the minister's office. He opened them all and he gave them 1.5 acres of land for free. He gave it to them. Now, they're only halfway there at this point because they actually only have land, but they have no trees. So what do they do? They then start to try to raise money to buy saplings, but they realized that this was out of their, that was out of their uh, you know, jurisdiction. It wasn't possible. They didn't have the capabilities to raise that much money. This was mathematics coming in straight away. So they then approached a local uh, horticulturalist and asked him for a loan, not a cash loan, but a sapling loan. They asked him, can you loan us 5,000 saplings from your, uh, your, um, your center and we will pay you back? Once the saplings have grown, we will take cuttings, replant them, regrow them, and give them back to you. So this local man, he gave them the saplings, and I went to Nasik, and they planted a forest. And their main objective of planting this forest was one thing, to attract a bird. And they said, when the first bird arrives, we have succeeded. And they planted the forest, and we are now waiting for that bird to arrive. And it will arrive. But the whole point is, is that they used literacy, mathematics, all the things that are embodied in the curriculum to make some change in the world. And the outcome for those children is not a grade, it's not a point, it's not a score, it's not the top of the class, not even a certificate. It's actually changing the world. And they, in their own way, have made the world a little bit better. 
And that is what I think our goal and our objective as teachers is to use a curriculum to, you know, to entwine it with real world learning outcomes, give the children freedom and choice, and then let them trial and error and succeed if possible. Because when we do that, not only will our children be happier, but the world will be a better place. And we, as teachers, will be able to live our dream. We go to university and the lecturer says to you, when you leave as a graduate, you get out there and you get to that kindergarten class and you change the world. And you go into school with that whole, yes, I'm going to change the world. And then someone gives you a curriculum and says, say those words to those kids, mark the books and give them to me when you're doing your job. But that is not our job. Our job is to inspire. Our job is to change the world. Our job is to make learning real. And I think that we can actually do that. Well, thank you, Gavin. On that note, it's a good one to end because I think Gavin's inspired me and, and, and inspired all of you, I think, too. And, and that's in, today included people from um, at least Queensland, New South Wales and Victoria within Australia. I saw uh, New, some New Zealanders. Uh, we had someone from Botswana and Africa uh, and Indonesia uh, joined us. So uh, you travel widely around the world. And tonight we've been able to bring some people from around the world together. Um, and I'll, I, I'd loved your... Um, a reflection of, of Avatar in there too, where I saw, uh, I, I feel you. And I say, Gavin, I'm sure tonight we say, um, we feel you and what, what your uh, passion is and uh, what our passion should be as teachers. So um, people asked about certificates, they'll be issued upon request. If you if you wish to get one, email us at australia at mativia.com and we'll do a certificate for you. We'll send you the webinar recording. Um, and um, remember there's that offer to take up if you'd like complimentary access to the end of March, uh, scan the QR code, or if you miss it, get in contact with us. That's for Australia and New Zealand, but if you're interested elsewhere in the world, contact us and we'll put you in contact with your local representative to see um, what um, they can do for you. And uh, you will get a, a, a prompt about a survey, if you don't mind, to give us feedback on tonight's presentation and uh, and ideas about how else you would like us to serve you with this um, service of these complimentary webinars. So once again, thank you, Gavin, and thank you everyone for your time. Have a lovely evening or a day ahead of you if you're somewhere else in the time zones in the world. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Take care and thank you so much for having me. It's been a real pleasure.